This is F Society IRC Podcast, a Mr. Robot show. I'm your moderator of this chat, Harosha Shai. We are now on episode number four, Exploits. A lot happened on this episode. In particular, a lot happened with Elliot as a character. A lot of development and insight was given to him. Some of the motivations, perhaps, that were hinted at in previous episodes of why he was doing what he was doing. But there was added layers to it. And in particular, there are certain characterizations or certain aspects of his personality that are coming in into light as viewers of this show that was displayed on this episode. I have to say, uh, overall, before we get exact details of the episode, that this is probably one of the best episodes that I've seen on television in a very long time. In particular, the sequence in which uh, Elliot, in, in essence, uh, was having a, a drug dream. It's probably something I have not seen done that well on television since Twin Peaks, since the Twin Peaks slash X-Files era, uh, era of television. And it, it was phenomenal. Not only that, but it had a certain internal logic into it that made sense versus other depictions of either regular dream sequences or uh you know, drug dream sequences that have been depicted on television before that just overall didn't really make make sense internal internally. They may have been visually well done, but the logic of the dream sequences themselves were just not, they were just very messy. The other thing is that when there was a lot of hacking and computer stuff in this episode versus the last episode where, where it was very minimal. There was really only just one aspect of the show where there was hacking, and that was when uh, Tyler had hacked into the receptionist's phone which in which we will get into because that that aspect did pay off for him we're gonna change things up a little bit instead of me telling you what was real as i review the episode kind of scene by scene i'm gonna save it towards the end because there is quite a bit that's going on here and there's in particular uh the certain techniques and ideas that were being thrown out on behalf of both elliot and his hacker group on how to enact the plan so let's, let's start from the beginning of this episode. Now we find our protagonist, Elliot. He is in the stages of early withdrawal of his drug morphine. Um, he admits that he, you know, he's taken his last line. After which point he is going to go through the withdrawal stages and it's going to be extremely painful for him. But he is mustering on because he believes in the plan that he has developed that is counter, or I should say it's, not as murderous as Mr. Robot's plan in taking down Steel Mountain needs to be enacted and it needs to happen. So he takes his last line and he goes to the F Society meetup where they're going to talk about in detail Elliot's plan. Elliot's pitch to the team is not going very well. His plan is to mess with the thermostat within Steel Mountain, which will result in the tapes, uh, which we will go into the, at the end of the episode, they will become inoperable, and thus their mission has been com- has been accomplished. That the the tapes will no longer work, and therefore there are no longer any physical backups that e- Evil Corp can go to. But his team is not buying it. So what Elliot does is he takes a, a cassette tape and he he rips it apart and he puts the the ream of the tape onto a hot plate and he gives the visual by explaining to the team you know that's what we're doing is basically we're cooking the actual tape and then he pulls out a raspberry pi and he says we're gonna take this and we're gonna put this in the thermostat and this is how we're gonna get into steel mountain and even still after explaining his plan and giving some conviction uh, his team is still not buying the plan. They have no faith in the plan because the previous plan that they had was blowing up the natural gas pipeline that would take down Steel Mountain. They're all for that plan. They believe in that plan. They've been building up towards that plan. And now last minute, almost like an audible, Elliot is changing that plan. But then his his team starts to kind of rally. Uh, it starts with the, we don't get his, I don't recall seeing hearing his name in the episode, but the, Gentleman that kind of looks like your typical uh, hacker, uh, the, the the kind of fatter with glasses, uh, with the hipster beard, uh, rallies behind the plans like, I will look for, you know, the best thermostat that we can access to. Uh, the other hacker, uh, Romero, 
who's an older gentleman. Uh, he has that kind of the he has like a kind of a an Abe Lincoln beard going on. I want to say Abe Lincoln beard, but he has a I guess an Abe no not an Abe Lincoln, but he has a you know has a beard going on here, a little quaff of a beard, and he's he's going through the plan and he's like this this place is not built to be accessible it's you you can't we can't do this this is it's like he's not subtly but he's like telling Elliot this is a bad plan and Elliot's looking at his surveillance and goes looking at the photos and he goes I, I see six people I see six you know possible reaches right there and it's six people in the in the photograph and basically what they he wants Romero and their team to figure out is, you know, the social engineer to figure out a way to access one of those people to access Steel, you know, Steel Mountain. And then he, he sneezes and he coughs and he, he's starting to go through with the beginnings of the early withdrawals of morphine. And so he exit and Romero is like, where are you going? And he goes, we're done here. And he walks away. So he leaves the team to the plan, basically. We see Elliot talking about his last line again, and then it cuts away after he takes his last line. It cuts away to him walking his dog flipper, and he's going through the withdrawals. He thinks he has three days, and he's going to kick this baby. Um, And he sees two men walking down the street, one in front of him and one behind him. And again, this is his paranoia, which he already had while he was, you know, I guess leveled out with his drugs. Now it is exaggerated to the, I guess you can say the nth degree because he's going through withdrawals and he starts yelling at them, like wondering what they, what, what they want. Why are they there? Why, you know, why are they approaching him? And so he rushes back home with Flipper and then his door starts banging and he starts freaking out. He starts freaking out big time. He, he's almost into a panic mode. He's, he thinks he's been found out that everything's going to come crashing down on him. So it's not any men in black or the authorities coming to get him. It's actually Darlene, and she is bringing him back to the F-Society meeting because they need a little bit more from Elliot with this plan, this plan that while they're working on it, they're not exactly on board with the plan. So they go to the meeting, and there's quite a bit of discussion going on as Elliot enters the room. There's a kink in the plan, and Romero just basically says that we shouldn't be doing this. And the reason why there's a kink in the plan is because Evil Corp, under the the guidance of their new CTO, Tyler Wellick, have decided that they're going to back up all their analogs physically and then ship them to five separate different locations that are just as secure as Steel Mountain. Thus, their plan as it, it currently is being done is moot because once those uh, uh, shipments go out and go to those five locations, they're not going to be able to access those other locations either at at the same time or all at once. It's just improbable for them to do. And Elliot is, you know, panicking and and he's thinking, he's thinking about it for a second and he still wants to go with the plan ahead. Uh, It's March 29th. The April 1st is when they're going to start doing this. So they have, in essence, four days to enact this plan. He thinks they still have time to be able to do this in a very uh, nonviolent manner, not uh, blow up Steel Mountain with a uh, gas explosion. But Romero is not buying it, and he calls Elliot on his bullshit. He he basically says that maybe these you know these young whippersnappers, Romero is a much older guy, don't don't know what. Elliot's all about that Elliot is a junkie and he's going through withdrawals and that his judgment is basically impaired and he sees through Elliot and he knows what's happening and Elliot's like I'm under control this is not a big deal I can handle this but they rally once again around Elliot and this plan and Elliot makes the decision that he is going to go into Steel Mountain to put in the the raspberry pie into the thermostat uh, Trenton, which is the name of the, the little Muslim girl, um, and Darlene are going to stay behind, and they are going to come up with the actual program for the Raspberry Pi. Uh, Rome, Romero and the uh, the typical nerd, uh, they're going to, well, the typical nerd has the floor plan, so he's going to know exactly which thermostat is going to be necessary for Elliot to go into. Romero is the one who's going to come up with the social engineering. He has to do the prep for it, and he doesn't think there's enough time to do it. Um, they basically have to put this plan on together before April 1st. Not only that, but they also have to get the Dark Army, which they have basically 
I don't know, paid a petition to take out China. And Darlene is responsible for uh, contacting the Dark Army to get them to attack the Chinese facility uh, pretty much at the same time as a coordinated attack that they're going to be attacking Steel Mountain and so in the server that they have access to in Evil Corp. So there's a lot of balls in the air that are going on here. And Romero, like I said, he's calling Elliot on his shit that he's a junkie and he's not going to be able to do anything and that this plan is shit and there's nothing that can be done about it. But they're going with the plan anyways. So Romero and the typical nerd, what they do is they're going to procure a car necessary for them on the road trip. And what they have is they have a scanner device that allows them to scan the the uh, the, do, 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 the keychain lock that people use to get into the car. And then as they get into the, the minivan, they then use a laptop to hack into the car. They don't use wires. They just plug in and they're able to start the engine and go about their day. At the same time they're doing this, they're, you know, Romero is voicing his kind of dissenting pen, opinion about Elliot, that there's, you know, there's something wrong with him, that this plan is shit and that he shouldn't be doing this. And the typical nerd guy is like, you know, what, basically, what else are we going to do? We've been planning it like this for months. What are we going to do? There is no alternative, really. So they're on the road. It's the guys, Mr. Robot, Romero, the typical nerd guy, and Elliot. And Elliot is, you know, having his internal monologue, and he's noting on the different things that people are, people are doing in the car, and he is having some issues, and he basically says, you know, he has some demons inside of him that are, in essence, controlling his abilities to function, and he throws up in the car. Uh, prior to that, before the, the takeoff on the trip, he and... Mr. Robot have a conversation and and Elliot is trying to convince Mr. Robot or maybe convince himself that this plan is going to work and that it's not his operation or whatever. And Mr. Robot saying, you know, you're the key to all this. Without you, basically, we can't do any of this. And so this is all these thoughts are going through, racing through Elliot's head. Uh, typical nerd and Romero, they, they pull off the road and they hack into a into a hotel room and they bring Elliot in and Romero is like you again you're, you're not in control of this situation you're gonna wish you know what he felt now you you, you wish you're gonna feel that way in like two hours from now because he's gonna start convulsing he's gonna start having the sweats he's gonna start you know going f- both both ends of his body I mean he's he's a mess so Elliot, Elliot tries to convince himself that he's going to kick this within within a day's time by saying, don't be mad at me. I'm going to change the world. I'm, I'm going to change the world. In essence, I'm thinking he's talking to Mr. Robot about this. Or not Mr. Robot, but uh, his friend, his imaginary friend. Uh, Romero and the typical nerd guy are, are just looking on, just aghast or whatever. And Mr. Robot is trying to help him in the bed. So basically, he's going through this withdrawal process, and we cut away to Angela and her boyfriend, Ollie. And Angela has made a decision that she's going to take this disc, and she takes Ollie's um, pass key, and she's going to do this herself, possibly. But it's, a, but it's a fake out. She actually goes to Elliot's apartment and is banging on the door to try to get his attention, so... He can look at this disc and tell her what the hell's going on, and maybe she can, she's going to disclose what's happening. But he's not there, and so she runs into Shayla, and Shayla's telling her, "No, you know, he's not here. She doesn't know where he is." But hey, maybe you should come with me. I'm walking Flipper. Do we just go for a walk? It might be good for her. She can Shayla can tell that that uh, Angela's in a bit of distress at the moment. So they go off and they're, they're going to go for a walk with Flipper. And we cut back to the hotel room and Romero and the typical nerd guy are having a conversation about a hacker movie. And it's kind of a meta thing, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So they're in there having a conversation and Elliot's observing. He's still going through the pains of withdrawal and everything. So we got back to Darlene and Trenton and Trenton is working on the program that's going to be put on the FTP which is a a remote server, and we'll talk about this later. Uh, The program for the Raspberry Pi, Darlene comes in, and she wasn't able to contact um, the Dark Army. And this is is a kink into the plan. Again, there's all these balls in the air. And Trent is like, if we can't get the Dark Army compliant, I mean, we have to do 
the steel mountain in China at the same time, this plan is not going to work. And then Darlene remembers that, you know, it's it's Sunday and she knows where her guy is. And Trent is like, you know, the Dark Army is not something you, you mess with or play with. It, it, it maybe they shouldn't be approaching them on a one-on-one -on -one basis. But Darlene's persistent and Trent is, in response is persistent in following Darlene. And so we have a, a couple of different team-ups and matchups going on. At the same time, they, it cuts away to Angela and Shayla. And they are, you know, walking the dog and having conversations and talking. And basically, Shayla gives Angela, you know, something to mellow her out, a pill to mellow her out so she can, you know, kind of relax and, and meditate and not think whatever it is she's not disclosing to Shayla and think about it. So Romero, we cut away to Elliot and he's going through major withdrawals and he's just out of sorts. So Romero is having an, what looks like an argument with Mr. Robot about what to do, whether or not to drop off Elliot at a hospital, to leave him behind. And uh, Mr. Robot just yells at him, well, well if you want to leave, then leave. And that's what Romero and uh, the nerdy guy do. They leave the hotel, which leaves Elliot and Mr. Robot alone together as Elliot is going through his withdrawal process. So Elliot um, goes through a, a very trippy drug sequence and it reveals quite a bit about his character and, and what's going on with him. We'll, we'll save that part for last. Um, but when he wakes up from this drug sequence, he just basically is breaking down. And, um, you know, he's he's basically having his emotional outlet that he's alone. And that's his biggest fear is that he's going to be left alone, all alone, which is where, it, where he seems to be at until Mr. Robot comes out of the darkness and says that he's not alone. That he's not he that Mr. Robot's here for him. Elliot is extremely grateful for that. He he's relieved that Mr. Robot is there and that he's not alone. So we basically cut back to uh, Trent and Darlene, um, the hacker team girl duo here, and they end up what they end up doing is they they didn't find the, their contact at the place that Darlene thought he was going to be, and so they start leaving and wondering. And then Darlene sees the limo. So Darlene and Trenton get into this limo and in it are these guys wearing demon masks and they ask for their cell phones and they toss the cell phones out of the limo and they take Darlene and Trenton to the location of her uh, her dark army contact. We briefly, briefly cut back to Shayla and Angela and like, it's clear that they're, they're bonding with one another and Angela is like expressing her fears and it pretty much has been most likely doing this through this whole bonding process that she's, she, you know, she worries about everything basically and Shayla is like you, you, the only person you need to worry about the only person you need to be concerned about is the bad bitch in the mirror is you and she needs to like not worry about everything and even Shayla kind of discloses not necessarily her worries but kind of her philosophy like she doesn't worry about anything she just moves on from one thing to another and if one job work doesn't work out then she goes to the next job and uh, Shayla's basically is like, you know, I'll just be a waitress now that this, you know, her drug dealing days are over because um, her drug supplier has been busted. And so they have this bonding experience. They're at this club and, you know, it seems like Angela has a kind of like a turn of, sp of spirits. She doesn't seem so down or so uh, agitated any longer. She seems almost like kind of a relief has gone over. Like she's made a decision or she's done a bit of an acceptance of the state that she's in is no longer worried about it. So we cut back to the girls, uh, the hacker duo of Trinan and Darlene, and they get dropped off by the the limo people and they meet with, and she meets up with a dark army contact. And it turns out her dark army contact is Darlene's ex fiance that uh, she broke up with. And they have some words and exchanges and he's telling her not to get involved with these people that he's involved with. That they don't mess around, that they're not interested in the same ideology or the same almost like hippie dreams that she she has about doing good for the world they're they're down and dirty about just about the money and she's pleading with them to basically make contact to let them know that they have to do this on the date and time or that's it basically so after basically in essence Darlene has convinced her guy that this is this is the plan this is what they're doing we cut away to um, to Elliot, who's in the hotel room, and he wakes up, and Romero's there, and he's giving him a concoction that's going to help him with his withdrawal symptoms. 
And as Romero leaves, he shouts out that make sure he keeps chugging that that concoction. And uh, this is an indication that once again that perhaps Mr. Robot is there. I'm not sure. Again, it's again they make this whole Mr. Robot thing very ambivalent of whether or not he's real or not real. Uh, but Elliot starts talking to his friend again, which it seems I guess he wasn't really talking to him. But they they have a, another conversation together. So he has a conversation with his friend about demons and what they do to to people and what they do to themselves and about his demons and how he's combating and basically slain and dealing with them. And it cuts away to Trenton and uh, Darlene. They make it back to the to the location. I guess they're still waiting on the boys. And then it cuts to Angela. And Angela is at all safe um, in the early morning hours before anyone is there. And she goes into the office using her boyfriend's um, key card, goes to his computer, and uploads the disc. And the disc uh, does its thing. It pops a screen back on, on and it's done. Uh, then uh, Angela hears somebody coming. She forces the disc out of the computer and exits uh, the building before what looks like to be her boss's secretary comes in. So it remains to be seen exactly what happened there with the all safe uh, hack, but it is very clear that Darlene has set up her boyfriend for any fallout that's about to happen. We end the episode with um, Angela's exits the building safely, and Elliot is now on the road with the boys, and they're going towards Steel Mountain, and thus ends the episode with uh, Elliot just talking about how he's glad his friend is there, and that he's facing his demons, and and then whenever he breaks through or is supposed to break through, that there's people there, familiar faces there on the other side of his breakthrough. And thus ends the episode. Uh, overall, I thought the episode was very intriguing. Um, get greater insight into Elliot's character. The plot moved very quickly and very rapidly. There's a lot of tension going on because you don't you have no idea whether or not this, this plan that Elliot has developed is going to work, whether or not, you know, Dark Army is going to come through what their alternative if they are responsible for the all safe uh, network breach that uh, Angela is respond responsible in implementing there's there's a lot going on and what if anything that Tyler will new CTO has to do with any of this if anything at all whether than just being the the protagonist I guess or another protagonist for Elliot to deal with in his battle with uh, evil corp so before we get into the, the discussion about the, the dream sequence, the drug dream, dream sequence that Elliot had, we're going to talk about what was real on the episode. What was real on this episode? Well, so we'll start from the beginning with the key device that's going to enable them to take down Steel Mountain, and that is the Raspberry Pi. For those who aren't familiar with the Raspberry Pi, it is a computer board, a computer device that was developed by the Raspberry Pi Foundation in the UK, and it's a credit-sized single-board computer with the ability for you to augment it for your needs. Uh, you can add whatever type of code you want to from Java, CPC+, uh, Linux. You can do BBC Basic. You can uh, add wireless to it. You can add different types of power code. You can upgrade it to what you feel you need. There's all these different kinds of hacks that people have done or different types of devices people have built around this particular computer board from developing their own type of game boards to having a remote control for the TV to have to operating their own VPN, which is a uh, something that was mentioned in the episode to developing their own hardware uh, wallet for those who are into uh, cryptocurrencies. There's a number of different things that people have utilized this board for, and it's very cheap. It goes anywhere from 24 to up to $54. It, de it depends on how many, how much Ram you're getting and which edition you are you're getting uh, right now there's a raspberry pi 2 uh, which is a model b which is the the model that is used uh, on the on the show uh, which is which came out in february of 2015 of this year it has the capability of having a, a one gig of ram it has four ports on it it has 40 gpl pins full hdmi port ether port it combines 3.5 uh, millimeter audio jack and composite video 
It has a camera interface, a display interface, uh, a micro SDD card slot, a video core for a 3D graphic card. So there's a lot that is on here that uh, you can utilize. It also has a, a 90 uh, megahertz quad core AMR Cortex A7 CPU. So it has the ability to process. It has a gig of RAM. And you can add these different components to it and, allow it, and it also allows you to hook up and connect to any type of system that currently exists. All you have to do is just modify it to fit that need. And what was key about this is they want to develop their own virtual pr private network within Steel Mountain so they can control the Climate Control Center. And why they want to control the Climate Control Center is it has to do with the type of tapes um, that are the backup tapes that are being stored in Steel Mountain. Uh, we'll get into the tapes for the moment, but to go on a bit more about the Raspberry Pi, once they've, in, before they can install it, they have to upload the program, which is what uh, Trenton and Darlene are doing, is they're developing the program for the, the control, the climate control device. And how they're doing that is they're using a program called, or a file type of system or utilities called TAR. And what TAR is, is, is a computing TAR is a computer software utility for collecting many files into one archive file for distribution or backup purposes. So they're placing all the type of hacks that they necessary they need for developing of the, to, to control the Raspberry Pi, to control, to develop the, the virtual private network for them to access the Steel Mountains uh, network, to control the climate control system and exploit it. They're using this type of system called TAR, which allows them to condense and compile all these files into one. And then what they're going to do is they're going to use what is called a file transfer protocol, FTP, which is standard network protocol used to transfer computer files from one host to another host over a TCP-based network, such as the Internet. So they have their own personal uh, built client server that they're going to upload this program to, this uh, FTP, the, pro the TAR program for the Raspberry Pi that the boys, when they when they get to Steel Mountain, are able to access and download into the Raspberry Pi, and then Elliot is going to walk into Steel Mountain with the Raspberry Pi. Now, mind you, ras the Raspberry Pi, if you take out your credit card, that's about as big as what it is. So it's a, it's a very small device. It's easy to hide, and it's very easy if you have an understanding of hardware and computers to, to manage. There's not much going on with it. There's not a lot of do hookies or anything like that attached to it. It's, it's almost like, like a plug and play type of a system. It basically in essence is what the Raspberry Pi is. Now, what is a VPN? A VPN is a virtual private network. Uh, it extends a private network across a public public network such as the internet. It enables computers or network enable devices to send and receive data across shared public networks as if it were directly connected to the private network while benefiting from the functionality, security, and management policies of the private network. So basically what it is, is when they get into the Steel Mountain, when Elliot gets in Steel Mountain, and he goes to whatever climate thermostat that um, nerdy guy tells him is the best spot to exploit, and he plugs it into the to the thermostat, and he plugs the Raspberry Pi in, and allows them to develop the the just deploy their virtual private network. Basically, he's thinking of it as a private box that they have inside of Steel Mountain that only they can access. No one can access the information. They're able to transfer everything across the, the internet and stuff, but nobody will else else will have access to this uh, virtual private network. Uh, you often see uh, VPNs utilized by uh, a lot of people for. The purpose of being anonymous on the internet, you know, masking their IP addresses. Uh, for a while there, a lot of people were using uh, HOLA, which is H-O-L-A, which is a, a virtual private network uh, program that allowed people to, mostly people were using it for Netflix. Uh, so you could uh, go onto your Netflix account and say that you were in England or uh, or in Canada. Basically spoof the, your IP location around the world on this virtual private network without revealing your your current location. And in, in something I personally did until on uh, Netflix changed its term of usage and basically banned the use of uh, VPNs to access the, to Netflix. But you can still, there's different types. I highly, I highly don't recommend Hola because there's an issue of them deploying malware onto people's computers. Uh, but there are other private, virtual private networks out there if you're interested in privacy and interested in control that you can purchase uh, by 
uh, much like a cloud service, which will allow you to access the virtual private network, and mask your IP address, secure your information in a, in a, a more secure manner than what is currently what currently done when you go what is called the clear net, which is the public internet that everybody utilizes because your traffic can easily be intercepted or or attacked, whether it be DOS attacks or malware or, you know, NSA type of stuff. So once they, once they can, once they've activated the Raspberry Pi and once they have activated their virtual private network, then they can get into the Steel Mountains network and what they can do is change the climate controls. And why they want to cl- change the climate controls within Steel Mountain, it has to do with what's called tape backups. Now, you may or may not have seen these uh, type of devices, depending on your age, maybe utilized in person. But what these magnetic tape storage devices are, it's just like a cassette player, but they're these massive data reels. Uh, if you ever seen that movie, War Games, or ever seen uh, any com- movie that has from the computer, computer age of the 80s and maybe the early 90s, you might see these big reel tapes that are in these uh, stand-up boxes. They're these big gray boxes just rolling around. Well, that's what a lot of computers were based off. They were based off these magnetic tapes before we got into the, you know, the data chips and uh, floppy disk and now USB drives and different types of storage. But magnetic tip, uh, t- tape is still utilized as a cold storage method to store information. A lot of companies utilize this method because uh, if you can safely secure the climate of this data, the magnetic tape, it's, it's not going to go bad. It's not going to erase, and they can store a lot of information. Uh, in fact, in May of 2014, uh, Fujifilm um, followed Sony and made an announcement that they have a 154-terabyte tape cartridge uh, that should be available by the end, end of 2015. So these are tapes are, are basically all the backups of all the information that Evil Corp has. And they're not the only corporation that's in Steel Mountain. A lot of corporations have these backup data tapes that are available. They're sitting on the shelf or sitting in devices that are being preserved for the sole purpose if anything happens, if their servers collapse, if there's some kind of snafu, a tsunami sweeps your island or you know earthquake and everything comes crashing down and there's a physical damage or wipe out of servers or anything of that nature, they can pull these physical disks, reload all that information onto a server, and they're good to go. This is why they want to take down Steel Mountain, because as long as there's these type of backups, then Evil Corp will still be in business. Not only that, but magnetic tapes are much better than having paper backups. Think of all the reams of paper that would be necessary to back up everything that Evil Corp as a corporation uh, had been doing or transacting over however long that Evil Corp has been in existence. There, there's not enough room or enough space in existence for them to maintain or keep. And so that's why a lot of them have these, these reels, these magnetic tapes that they utilize to preserve and protect their backup of information. Another side note is that uh, the demonstration that, uh, Elliot did uh, when he was trying to demonstrate to his fellow hackers what exactly what it is they were doing uh, to the, the to the tapes in South Sea Mountain when they messed with the climate control. The tape that he ripped apart was a Memrex compact disc. Uh, if you're a kid of the 90s, there was those yellow uh, tape discs. There was like 90 minutes so you can record off the radio or make your own mix, mix tapes too. They were quite popular. Uh, it was a Memrex compact disc cassette. That's what it looked like to me personally. And that's what he ripped ripped apart. Uh, another thing that is real that was utilized on the show, but a bit of a puzzle for me personally, was the RF scanner that uh, Nerdy Type Guy and uh, Romero were using to uh, scan for and access to the, uh, the minivan that they were going to use for the road trip that they had stolen. Uh, such devices exist. Uh, is an actual bit of an issue when it comes to electronic cars. When people have cars that can open um, through a key lock of some sort, even the uh, pat the keyless vehicles. That if you can scan the signal, you can access a person's um, car and steal it. Even the ones with the push button cars have this particular issue. Uh, personally, with me, that the scanner in itself was quite large. 
The ones I've personally seen through YouTube videos and discussions through hacker boards have been much smaller than that. And the reason being is if you are stealing someone's car, you don't want to walk around with look like something like a like in a radio, really. And that's what most of these RF scanners were, the, or at least the initial ones before they got smaller were, they were all like radios that would scan the RF signal because that's the signal that's being utilized by uh, car companies to open and unlock doors. It was quite large. It's quite, quite cumbersome. It's not something you can easily stash into your pocket or in your purse or a backpack or, or anything of that nature to hide Quite easily, if someone suspects that you're stealing a car, you can easily ditch it. Um, the other thing that was uh, very real is the fact that they utilize a laptop and they just basically plugged into a certain aspect of the the, the minivan there. They pu- plugged in underneath the car and they just basically ran the program and boom, the car activated. Uh, it's no different than if you were to take your car to to any either your dealership or any mechanic and they they plug in to do diagnostics on your car because most cars this day and age particularly any car i think they started putting chips in around 92 or 94 most vehicles you might have had some like cadillacs or some earlier cars in the in the late 80s but mostly it was in the 90s where you see a lot of these chips being utilized and now chips are in every vehicle for everything from power steering to your radio to your engine and batteries it's everything's all chip and that's possible that it's very easy to do it's not that difficult really there's so many programs out there for all the different types of vehicles that if you have an understanding and knowing what you're doing uh, you just plug in and boom you're good to go Okay, another big thing that was being utilized and something that basically the skill set that Romero has is social engineering. Social engineering is something that even Elliot himself does when he hacks into, you know, his therapist's um, background information and finding out uh, who her boyfriend is, about Ollie, about the drug dealer he put away. He finds out certain bits of information about a person and he, he manipulates and utilizes it to gain more information. For example, when he, in the first episode, when he called his psychiatrist um, douchebag of a boyfriend, he pretended he was a bank and he utilized what basic information he already knew about the boyfriend to get, get, garner more information. It happens all the time. Like someone calls you over the phone, they say you're from the bank or they say you're from this other company and they ask for your name, your address. They go through the list like they are actually from the company, but when in fact they're actually not and they manipulate people to uh, find whatever data they need, whether it be the phone number, social security number, uh, what they think of the basic information about you to figure out your password so they can access your information. And the type of uh, social engineering tax there, very pervasive in the world are phishing. Uh, phishing scans uh, might be the most common type of social engineering tax used today. They seek to, you know, detain the personal information, which basically what Elliot does uses linkage. And basically what it is, is is either it's a website or a email that's sent to people to kind of garner that information. They pretend to be from the company that they that they think they know that you're affiliated with, whether it be like, you know, Bank of America or recently in the cryptocurrency world. um, What was the name of it? One of the wallet companies. Um email servers was breached and they were using that technique to fish and find out people's private uh, keys in order to access um, their wallets. Uh, It's a common uh, tactic. Uh, Pretexting. Pretexting is another form of social engineering where attackers focus on creating a good pretext or fabricating a scenario they can use to try to steal their victim's personal information. These type of attacks that commonly take form of of scammers who pretend that they need a certain bit of information for their target in order to confirm their identity. Uh, most advanced attacks will also try to manipulate the targets and perform an action that enables them to exploit a structural weakness in an organization or company. A good example of this would be an attacker who impersonates as an internal IT service auditor and manipulates the company's physical security staff into letting them into the building. Unlike phishing email, emails, which use fear and urgency to advantage pretexting attacks, rely on building a false sense of trust with the victim. This requires the attacker to build a credible story that leaves a little room for doubt on the part of the target. This happens all the time. This is something of a way that hackers do to gain access to networks. They pretend to be either part of the staff in some fashion, either higher up or lower down, in order to manipulate the the individual on the phone or even in person to gain access to information. 
uh, is quite of quite often utilized on big, large companies, even sometimes small businesses. But you hear this often with large companies to gain access to either, you know, the database and network. And then you have like all these credit card information is getting stolen. Um, baiting is in many ways similar to phishing attacks. However, what distinguishes them from other types of social engineering is the promise of an item or a good or good that hackers use to entice victims. Uh, baiters may often use free music or money downloads if they surrender their login credentials to a certain site. So this happens when you like you're going on a site and they're like, oh, you want a free download of music or movies? Uh, log in with your Facebook account, and then now they have access to your Facebook account, and now that Facebook does. Um, Financial stuff now, now they can have access to your bank account. Uh, Quid pro pro is similar. Attack promises a benefit in exchange for information. This benefit usually assumes a form of service. For baiting, frankly, takes the form of good. One of the most common types of quick pro attacks involve fraudsters who impersonate IT service people and who spam calls as many direct numbers that belong to the companies they can find. These attackers are offered IT assistance to each and every one of their victims. The fraudsters will promise a quick fix in exchange for employee disabling their AV program and for installing a malware on their computer that assumes the guise of software, a software updates. And tailgating, another social engineering attack type is known as tailgating or piggybacking. These type of attacks involve someone who lacks the proper authentication following an employee into a restricted area. A common type of tailgating attack, a person impersonates a delivery driver and waits outside a building. When an employee gains security approval and opens the door, the attacker asks that the employee hold the door, thereby gaining access off of someone who's authorized to enter the company. Tailgating doesn't work in all corporate settings, such as in large companies where all persons enter a building are required to swipe a card. However, in mid-sized inter- enterprises, attackers can strike up a conversation with an employee and use that this to show familiarity to successfully get past the front desk. So tailgating might be a method that they might be utilizing to gain access to Steel Mountain. But again, you have the the whole key carding issue, which if you saw the photos from the TV, sh- from the show, from the surveillance, is something that all the people have. Um, so, But these are the type of methods, and this is a skill set that Romero has. And for him to be able to figure out how to access steel mountain by manipulating people within and around that area it's it takes time it takes a skill set and he doesn't believe there is enough time for him to deploy this type of method on anyone associated with the steel mountain and social engineering on the you know the whole concept of scamming people you know it's a con that's been around for a long time but as far as hacking goes it's it goes back to freaking which was the ability of what phone freaking is, is a freaking is someone who loves exploring the telephone system and experimenting with it to understand how it works. Uh, Phone freaking got to start in the late fifties. The golden age was the sixties and seventies. Basically these are people who manipulated the uh, phone systems to get uh, free phone calls. You may have heard or seen the stories about people using um, a whistle out of a cereal box to be able to fool the phone companies because it was at the same frequency to be able to access the network and get free phone calls. Also at the same time that um, what these freakers would do is they would constantly call using free numbers to access certain types of phone networks to gain more information about a company, uh, manipulating uh, phone operators. Um, Because back in the day, there was whether these trunks where literally in some places in the country where you actually would talk to an operator and that operator would connect you long distance. So you actually had to talk to somebody within a company to order to gain further access into another, either within a city or within a state. And so they would manipulate um, typically women and not exclusively women within that agency to go further on. Sometimes they would uh, talk to people within like AT&T or Bell, which were the companies at the time, to gain further access to the network by pretending or being somebody else within the network to order to gain further access to make all these free calls and talking to people and doing lines. Um, these were kind of the, the prototypes for what would be the hackers that would come with the existence of computers. And finally, when Angela inserted the disk into the computer in all safe. I personally am not sure what type of program was being utilized, but that particular method or methodology is quite common. Uh, Even though CDs don't have as much uh, data or the ability to hold as much data on it as versus 
like a, a USB drive or an actual portable hard drive, it doesn't necessarily have to. All it has to do is have the right kind of amount to access the computer in itself. If you looked at the screen, you can see how the program popped open briefly and then disappeared. It's obviously, it's, it has a root kit program attached to it where it's hiding within the computer. And it, all it's doing is no doubt, it's just opening a port that will allow whoever is on the other side of this particular program to access that computer. And from that computer, they can access the network. So they, it's necessary, not a, a great deal of information is necessary for this particular program to work. It's just, it's very unique in the sense that it was very quickly implemented. So I'm not quite sure personally what type of program it was, but I'm sure no doubt within the next couple episodes, we're going to find out what has happened with that. Another side note, it appears that due to the hacking that Tyler Willick did on the receptionist, the receptionist, the male receptionist to his boss, he is now the CTO of Evil Corp. So ha- hacking is currently right now paying off for some people in this show. And it remains to be seen whether or not it's actually pay off or further make a further payoff for F Society. So that is it with, for what is real. Uh, now we're going to talk about Elliot's drug dream. Let's talk about Elliot's dream. And there's a number of different philosophies and psychological interpretations of dreams. And it seems that what are we being shown with this uh, drug dream that as he's going through the stages of withdrawal is that he is it, he's not only exploring his inner self, but he's also revealing some self-truths that we as an audience are not aware of. So we're experiencing these self-truths at the same time that Elliot is. So we're going to cover just three, I think, key possible influences on this particular drug dream as far as the psychological, uh, philosophical aspects of the interpretations of dreams. One of them is the granddaddy of them all, which is Carl Jung. Carl Jung's basic principles or ethos when it comes to the interpretation of dreams is that he believed that dreams are revealed more than they conceal. They are the natural expression of our imagination and use most of the straightforward language at our own disposal. Uh, mythic nar- narratives because uh, Jung you know, rejected Freudian's theory of dream, dream interpretation that dreams are designed to be secretive he also did not believe that dreams formation is a product of discharging our taboo sexual impulses and surprisingly enough Jung did not believe that dreams need to be interpreted for them to perform their function instead he suggested that dreams are doing the work of integrating our conscious and unconscious lives he called this the process of, of indiv- Individuation is easy to think of individualization as a mind quest for wholeness or the quality of appeal to wisdom that separates elders from grumpy old men. While not required, working with dreams and amplify the mystic components can hasten along the process. So Jung's whole philosophy, and in this, uh, I'm bringing this information from Dream Studies Portal, which we'll have a, sh- a link in the show notes, is that what happens within our existence and what happens in life and our daily activities, we kind of process it through our dreams. Any misgivings, misunderstandings, or any any self awareness that we're seeking, we will we will have them in our dreams. Which is something that through the process of through the drug withdrawal that that Elliot is experiencing. Now, there's also another interpretation, which is um, a primitive instinct rehearsal theory of dreaming. Uh, this is something fairly new. It was developed sort of in the 2000s. I'm getting this from a wiki article. Uh, true researchers have postulated that dreams have a biological function where the, where the content requires no analysis or interpretation, and the content provides an automated simulation of the body's psychological functions underpinning the human instinct behavior. So dreams are part of the human and animal survival and development strategy. Uh, this theory is by uh, Professor Ante uh, Rovosa. It has limited ideas to those of the a threat rehearsal where dreams exercise our primal self-defense instincts and has argued that kind of, the connectivity is a number of publications. Uh, Keith Stevens extends the theory to all human instincts, including the, the threats to self, threats to family members, pair bonding and reprodu- reproduction, inquisitiveness and challenges, and they drive for the personal superiority and tribal status. He categorizes dreams using a sample of, of 2,000 
internet submissions in nine categories, demonstrating the universal commonality of dream content and instinct rehearsal. He postulates that dream functions in an automatic and responsive content, exercising and stimulating the body chemistry and neurological activity that will come into play if a scenario occurred in real life, so the dream does not have to be remembered to achieve its objective. It is argued that once a dreamer has experienced a threat in the dream, either to self or family member, his or slash ability to confront and overcome a real life threat is then enhanced. So the such dreams in both humans or animals are an aid to survival. The threat rehearsal can be specific, for instance, an attack from a savage dog, but it could also be general and the threat response psychology is active or new force with dreams. So for example, if an individual has a threat by a fear of like climbing or they believe that a person that they, they you know they have a problem with their boss and the inability for them to confront them but they confront this boss or their fear of climbing within the dream then they have the stronger possibility of in real life when that situation presents themselves that they have the opportunity to do a climb or confront their boss that they have the skill set or the wherewithal to confront that boss that that threat because they they dreamed about it the state of Elliot's dreaming begins with Romero leaving and Elliot begging Mr. Robot for another hit, that if he just had a another hit, then he would be better. He would be able to get through the withdrawals and basically, in essence, complete the mission. And Mr. Robot is like, no, I'm, I'm not doing that for you. I'm not I'm not going to do it. But Elliot keeps persisting and, and Robot, Mr. Robot gives in. And you see them exiting in a uh, taxi cab and it's clear that they must be going to some type of drug house. And this drug house, the, I guess you can say the guy who's posted up to be the on, the watch out guy or the doorman, if you will, won't let Mr. Robot in unless he also pays and goes and uses. Otherwise, they, they're not be not going to be allowed in the house. So Robot, Mr. Robot pays the guy for two goes beyond the uh, the doorman, goes to the side entrance, is carrying Mr. Mr. Robert is carrying Elliot. And he's like, okay, you, you go in there, you get your hit, and then you come out. Just like that. Nothing else. So Elliot goes into the, to the den of it, of drugs. And he sees F Society, like, I guess either posters or graphic graffiti, um, in the house. And it's actually kind of scattered throughout the house. You, you notice it. Because Elliot notices it. And the drug dealer is like, hey, over here. He goes over to the guy and he's like, I want some morphine. And guys, he guy says he doesn't have that. He has something better. And he gives Elliot heroin. So Elliot, you know, he takes it. He gets some assistance from a girl who ties him off and injects him with some heroin. And in the background, there's a television on with the news. And it's a report, it sounds to me like it's a report from about Evil Corp, but not exactly positive if that's the case, because um, it's very mooted. You, you have no idea the exact nature, but that's just something I suspected it is. And then Elliot is, you know, getting, he's going through this high, and in the background, way a bit of a distance in another room, a man shoots another man, there's a struggle. He starts firing, and then he starts just gunning people down. He guns down the woman that was helping Elliot. He guns down the drug dealer. He even hits Elliot. And Elliot is just plopped down on the ground. And he's in front of the television in this room. Everyone else who was able to make it has scattered. Then all of a sudden, the uh, television intercuts, and it's an F Society video. And it's what we believe to be Mr. Robot, but we're not positive if it is Mr. Robot, in the mask, and he's speaking. And he's saying to the masses that you need to wake up, that the, the corporations, you know, don't want them to speak, don't want you to think out, don't want you to do anything. And that they're here to exercise the villains, to reveal the villains and exercise the demons. And Elliot is just staring, and he's just staring at this video and he's smiling because these are his thoughts. These are his ideas that are being expressed through this video by F Society. So he says something very interesting. We're here to retrieve lost, stolen, or damaged memories. We're here and we have your back. So in essence, this video is just speaking directly to 
our protagonist Elliot in of itself. Then it does the, uh, if you don't remember, but back in the day, they used to have this called the color bars, which is when a television station went in for the night. You know, TV did used to be 24-7, and they would have just the color bars. And there would is kind of a mix-up interco- interconnection of that. And we go, and it's revealed that Elliot is in a room with a video, video VHS camera, a video camera, similar to a setup in a place that F Society would be making his videos for the masses. So Elliot is there, and the spokesperson for F Society that we suspect is Mr. Robot, and it's revealed by his voice that it is Mr. Robot. He takes off a key and gives it to Elliot, and then he takes off his mask, and there's another mask below it, and he gives the mask to Elliot, and he says the key and the mask are for Elliot, and, and Elliot puts it on. So right now, it's it's been revealed to the audience in of itself something we've already suspected that Mr. Robot is the spokesperson for F Society. He's the one making the videos. What's interesting is this key. This key is brought up throughout Elliot's dream. And this is the first time it's being brought up. So Elliot puts on the mask. He has the key around his neck. He asks about the key when it opens. Mr. Robot doesn't give him a direct answer. And he's speaking, still speaking to the camera because the both of them are still speaking to the camera. And Mr. Robot comes to the camera and he goes, you know, find your nonstick, turn the key. And, but before that, a word from our corporate overlords. And it literally cuts into... An E-Corp commercial, which I personally think this whole E-Corp commercial, again, speaks to the desire. If we're trying to interpret this this dream of Elias, his desire for normalcy, uh, which was touched upon in episode three. Uh, Elliot would love nothing more than to be normal. He didn't have that itch in the back of his brain. But that's not the case for him. He has that itch, and that's why he's on the path that he's on. After a brief snippet of the commercial, it cuts away to Elliot walking into like a, the classic scene of a suburban neighborhood. And as he's walking by, he sees a mailbox that's obviously must have been his mailbox at one point. And there's a house in front of it, and he turns to the house, and the house is gone. And there's a little sign that says 404, not found. So that the home that he's seeking, the place that he's looking, the place that that normalcy that he's seeking is not to be found here. And then you hear like a, a, a little child's voice and it turns out to be a girl and she, she's coming up to him and he turns to the girl and he goes, hello, friend. And he, I guess you can say Elliot is interpreting her as being perhaps a friend, his imaginary friend that he's been speaking to. She goes, we're not friends. And he asks her, you know, what happened to this house that was here? And she goes, um, well, first, before I answer, you, you answer my question. Who's your monster? And then she picks up a key and hands it to Elliot. And so this is the second time we see this key. So Elliot walks towards the field and he ends up walking into his apartment. And in his apartment is Tyler Warwick, the CTO of Evil Corp. And he's holding that same key. And as Elliot gets closer, his his fish, uh, QRT, starts talking to him and he's voiced by Keith David. And this is one of the like the funniest uh, scenes I've seen on television in a long time. I was just laughing through this whole entire scene. And his fish is just giving him some advice, you know, about how to deal with his situation. So QRT is explaining to Elliot that his life is in a loop. That he sees the same thing over and over again, and he will until the end of his life. And Elliot's like, well, what can I do for you? And he yells at him, Ruby! to a window because he his existence has basically been that fishbowl been on the, the, that side um, table and all he's seen is the things that are in that static position and there there is no change and you would love for Elliot to change that for him to get him out of that static position and then we cut away and Elliot's in a restaurant with Angela and he's eating a fish a fish that looks exactly like URT which is interesting. Or I should rather say that Angela is the one who's eating the fish. Um, and Elliot is like, Angela, he's he's my friend. And she offers him a bit of his fish and saying it's delicious. And he, he's not he's not going to eat any of, the, of his friend, him, QRT. So Elliot, he, he turns away and he sees a woman that appears to be um, 
his mother, an early version of himself, force feeding him some food. At the same time, he served a, a raspberry pie from Pops, it's Pop Special. And then Elliot bites into the pie and once again he has the key. But I also want to point out that the, the nature of the restaurant that he is at is it's like a cubicle with Angela on the opposite side of him. And he's surrounded by other people at cubicles and you can see in the background that there's like a server's blinking and different computer components. And again, he has he's holding up the, the, the key. It, Angela interprets it, the key as being a ring. And she says yes and rushes over to him. And he's he allows her, in the dream at least, to, to hug him. And he's smiling. And again, this is again speaking to his desire for some bit of normalcy. At the same time, again, you know, the raspberry pie is a symbolism of the computer component that he's going to use. They take down Iron Mountain. I'm sorry, uh, Steel Mountain. So Angela and uh, Elliot leave after it, everyone in the restaurant is congratulating them on this engagement. And Elliot, once again, is a change of scene. And Elliot is walking into the F Society home base. And he's dressed in a tux. He was walking through, and, and the scene is a bit different. There is a very interesting picture of a very uh, smiling man with these big deep blue eyes that's kind of done in the carnival style painting and I'm wondering if that is supposed to represent um, Tyler Warlick because it does have a kind of a similar appearance of him but most importantly there's like a kind of a deadness to the picture and there's two pictures there's one behind Angela and there's one behind um, Elliot and she walks over to him and she's like you know, I only told them what they wanted to hear. And I guess she's referencing perhaps to the restaurant. Um, but she says, you're not going to change the world. You were you're only born a month ago. You know, who's your monster? You're, you're afraid of your monster. Do you even know who your monster is? And she hands him his key back and tells him it doesn't fit. So Elliot asks, you know, why didn't the key fit? And she goes, isn't it obvious? You're not Elliot. And then it just, her voice is kind of computer distorted and then it cuts off. And he's in the darkness. He's in a, a black space alone. My personal interpretation of this is and this has to go with the whole theory of whether or not you believe Mr. Robot is real or not. If there's some kind of Tyler Durganis uh, going on here is I believe the personality that we, we have been seeing thus far in the show, this personality of Elliot is not real. That the actual um, personality is the friend that he's been talking to, the holo friend. Uh, and for whatever reason, that original personality created this more meeker, more mild version, I guess, of himself. Or we don't really know. But he created, you know, this particular personality for whatever purpose and reason to save the world. So that's, I think that's what the... The twist is going to be, it's not going to be that Mr. Robot's not real, is that the personality of Elliot is not real. So the, the darkness that Elliot is in, you hear all these children's voices, and all of a sudden there's a bit of a light. And it, we're kind of back to the starting point where Elliot is in front of the, the same video camera that he was in front of earlier, and the mask. And he speaks to the mask, and he's wondering, is the mask his, his friend or his monster? So he very hesitantly picks it up and he puts it, puts the mask on and his distorted voice speaks. Now the one other question that Elliot asks before he puts on the mask is, is he alone? And as he puts this mask on, his distorted, like I said, the distorted voice comes on. He says, I'm here and you are alone. And then all of a sudden the F Society location, which the video camera was taking place at, all the uh, equipment comes on. And Elliot just tears off the mask and starts panicking. And this is where he wakes up. And this is where he starts, you know, crying to himself because he believes he's alone. And that's that's to the point when Mr. Robot comes out of the darkness and he's like, no, you're not alone. I'm here. And so that's it for this review. There's a lot that went on here. Uh, in particular, I think this particular dream in of itself kind of reveals that there there are certain aspects of Elliot that are struggling with what's going on. Um, something that we already saw on the surface, but very deeply rooted really at the root of him, is struggling. More importantly, is the fact if 
my belief or my personal theory is true that the Elliot that we've been seeing is not the true personality of the real Elliot. And the other thing is that throughout this dream with the key and the fact that Tyler Willick was somewhat in the background and the evil corp stuff and Angela that perhaps he was it through this drug withdrawal he's revealing some truths to himself but not all the truths like there's a reason why he doesn't know everything there's a certain aspect of himself that has been deliberately locked away and that there's a key that it will reveal that another interpretation is the fact that elliot is the key to everything this is something that mr robot speaks about all the time to elliot with this plan that he is the key he is the the only way that they're able to enact this plan that f society has to wipe out all the credit like i said this is the end of the episode a very big episode look forward to the next episode in which they enact this plan where they put the raspberry pi in the thermostat at Steel Mountain and see if they are actually able to pull this off or not. Thank you for listening. This has been a Hiroshima Space Odyssey Network production.